so I guess what I'd like to do besides thanking Umi and the one and Nick from the one and my fellow curators, Ted and Kat, um, is I know a lot of you who have seen your names in the chat as participants. I don't know all of you, but I know that because you're here, you know as much as I do and have as much to contribute as I do. So I'm honored to have the opportunity to share and I'm really looking forward to hearing your responses. I like, I think it's 20 for other people, correct me if I'm wrong, responded to a prompt that was sent asking us to think about, uh, I'm also, a, let me just backtrack for a second for those of you who might be new. I'm also a member of a What Would an HIV Doula Do collective. And um, so I'm a curator, but I'm also in that the, the doula collective that has actively been thinking about how the transitions that come about because of HIV need to need space uh, that is produced by communities and individuals for all of us who are engaging in transitions consistently over a lifetime, whether that's an HIV diagnosis, whether that's um, a death that is related or not to HIV, whether that's a birth that's connected. And so um, we were asked to consider what would a COVID-19 doula do? And for many of us, we've been thinking about doulaing ourselves, our communities, each other for many years as a, a thought puzzle that our collective um, addresses. And so given that mine is so short, I'm just going to read my um, contribution and then highlight two or three points that like are my most important takeaways or what has stayed with me since I answered this. And then I'm going to pass the baton over to Tony who will um, share his contribution to the zine. Um, and you can see it so you can hear me read my words. A COVID doula holds space for people made vulnerable due to one or many viruses. Doulas make space for fear and love, help and incapacity. A COVID doula understands that illness makes people need and uncertainty about illness does the same. Doulas recognize the need of food, compassion, medicine, touch, information, distance, shelter, ideas, beauty, and more. A COVID doula listens and responds to needs, all the while evaluating risk, reward, vulnerability, and possibility with those they care for and with. Then a COVID doula takes these personal, material, and changing spaces, needs, and evaluations, shares them with other doulas, and makes space like a zine or this meeting to make some of this public, thereby drawing larger conclusions and demands about COVID. In this time of social distancing, a COVID doula holds spaces online and off using media memory and time to abet our art interaction and care until we can be together again in our bodies in person, we will be together through media. We will activate art and archives in search of proximity. We will use our devices as tools to connect. So the three things I'd like to highlight is um, what has always been true for me in my activism is whenever I can pair, whenever I think about trauma or damage or pain or vulnerability, I always want to pair that with power, with love, with possibility, with healing. And so in some of my sentences at the top, I'm making that effort. So to, to, to know that both are always true, that is, in, and in conversation, that is what the Metanoia show is about. And that's how transformation occurs from our pain, from injustice, from our vulnerability comes our greatest power. And we see that in the show. Um, the second thing I want to highlight about my contribution comes from feminist consciousness raising. So when we speak our pain, when we acknowledge the specific specificity of our own experience, our own illness, our own vulnerability, that is the beginning of collective work where we understand those as manifestations of social violence, social injustice, and structural 
um, my kids are talking, <laughs> structural um, disturbances that we have the, we can name collectively uh, and fight collectively by understanding our own experiences. So that, that's sort of the second half of that. And then the third half of my contribution is really trying to think um, about how the limits of social media and the limits of these technologies that are distancing us can be worked with productively, even if not perfectly, even if not completely to help us get through this time. And so that a lot of our work as doulas is now trying to imagine how to use these spaces and these technologies in ways that um, uh, respond to human need. So I'm gonna end with that and I'm looking forward to Tony's contribution. Thank you, Alex, that was beautiful. Um, and I'm looking forward to the conversation as well. Um, I'm Tony Valenzuela. I'm the executive director of the Foundation for the AIDS Monument in Los Angeles. It's an organization that is building um, a monument to comm commemorate um, those we lost and continue to lose to the AIDS um, pandemic. Um, and um, I, my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I wrote a sort of a companion piece to my zine piece. Um, and I just focused on um, the line, um, one of the lines which I made it into the um, title of, of this workshop. So I'm just going to um, read my piece here, which is brief. Um, in my brief zine contribution, I wrote, I don't respond well to disaster scenarios because I came of age during a disaster at a time when the sky was always falling, when politicians, public health, and media would regularly sound the alarm about queer bodies as deadly, diseased, pathological, and unless you practice safe sex 100% of the time. Hold on one second, my. And unless you practiced safe sex 100% of the time as criminal. I will state here emphatically there is no comparison between the crisis of the month public health approaches to queer folks sex lives from the past to the essential public health response today to COVID-19, the life-saving recommendations informed by science and data to keep the spread of the coronavirus as contained as possible. I'm grateful. I'm sheltering in place. I wear my mask when I go out. I'm being as patient as I can be for the world to open back up again. It's not easy. The other day I forgot my mask while walking my dog. The other day I accidentally pressed the walk button at a street corner with my bare finger. How will I slip up the next time? I don't respond well to disaster scenarios. I remember too clearly and painfully how often morality, shaming, and alarmism crept into public health messages in ways, even if unintended, that contributed deeply to the stigmatization of HIV positive people and queer folks sex lives, stoking fear about and control over our bodies. I can't forget this past, even while I celebrate and honor the life saving work by public health's response to COVID-19. Today, I cast a, discern a discerning eye between what's alarming and what's alarmist. Partisan politics has defined people who prioritize safety as liberals and people who prioritize the economy as conservatives. That's a trap. We all need to be safe and we all need our livelihoods. I don't respond well to disaster scenarios. I read an article this week about young people in Walla Walla, Washington who threw COVID-19 parties where an infected person mingled with guests to get their infections out of the way as a method to gain immunity. Initially reported to a local newspaper by, by the county's public health department, Days later, the director of the department walked back those claims saying they couldn't prove any of the guests that attended tried to intentionally contract the disease. The story reminded me of reporting in the 90s about HIV seroconversion parties, about gift givers and bug chasers, and how easily the media latched on to these fringe tales as confirmation of our depravity. In our new age of COVID-19, a BuzzFeed headline reads, the social media shame machine is in overdrive right now. 
HIV AIDS activism taught some of us to be vigilant against sensationalism, against shaming, against demonizing, because otherwise criminalization will follow. Years of stigmatizing HIV positive bodies led to queer phobic and AIDS phobic politicians in dozens of states to pass legislation criminalizing HIV transmission, often penalizing acts without any risk of actual transmission. Most of these laws remain on the books today. Yes, the HIV AIDS and COVID pandemic share some strong parallels. The fear of infection from a new and mysterious virus, mass deaths, a botched federal response, and the disproportionate impact on communities of color and other marginalized groups. The historic mobilization against AIDS is informing the mobilization against COVID, as many activists and writers have pointed out, the fact of which we should all be proud. With COVID-19, we must be vigilant to apply the lessons learned from our past victories and our past mistakes. I don't respond well to disaster scenarios. Tell us what you know and don't embellish. Understand and forgive before you blame. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex and Tony. This is a, already an amazing um, start to what is a great conversation. Um, something that we've been thinking a lot about as uh, what would an HIV doula do is this question that Alex mentioned, um, what does a COVID-19 doula do? And one of the things that we understand as we draw upon the past, we understand, as Alex said, a doula is someone who holds space during times of transition. And for HIV, we understand that HIV is a series of transitions that start long before a test and long after you're diagnosed. Um, and now in real time together, we're learning about what are the transitions of COVID-19. And I think we already heard both Alex and Tony lay out some of those transitions that we're already dealing with. And um, one of the things that I thought could be interesting to start us off is to think about the comparisons and contrasts. Um, and while um, Alex and Tony take that kind of first prompt, I just wanna remind everyone, as I said in the chat box, that uh, feel free to raise your hand if you wanna ask a question, we'll have some time for that soon. Or you can always just um, type it into the box. Um, right now we're figuring out why we can't um, message everyone. So Kang, I see that you have your hand up, so we'll call on you first. Um, so, Alex, do you want to start us off thinking about the contrasts and the relationship between COVID and HIV? I do. I'd actually like to make these points as quickly and efficiently as I can, because there's a lot of great people in the room, and I would really like to hear what everyone else has to bring to this question. And also, if people are, think, are help, can help me with my thinking, I appreciate that. And Tony's already laid the groundwork a bit on that. So I'm going to piggyback on um, some of what he's addressed. But I also wanted to just like raise a flag for two really important things that I heard Tony say that's not that are not exactly answers to this question that perhaps we can get to in the Q&A, which is the relationship between, um, oh, quick calls to panic and their response and criminalization. And I'd like to think about where we're seeing that um, and what we've learned uh, from HIV in relationship to the, uh, to the state uh, intervening in that way. And then uh, your really interesting comments about understanding, opening the economy as being a Republican position and health or, or distancing as a, as a democratic position. I, I think that was really, I mean, I just had never really thought about that and I appreciate that. So uh, in relationship to the question on the table, Tony's already said that viruses and, and um, catastrophes, sudden catastrophes that we don't expect always reveal to us the systemic inequalities that undermine our cultures, they make them visible, even though they're always present, newly visible. And um, we know that as that was true for HIV, that is increasingly more apparent and, as all, and is true for COVID-19. Um, as only one example, who has, who has access to testing, uh, the extraordinarily d d disparities already with amongst uh, people of color and white people in relationship to um, illness and death. So another similarity between the two is the incredible, the incredible bravery and importance of first responders and caregivers. And um, 
in HIV, I don't know that we understood that quite as clearly on a public level as we do now. <laughs> so the seven o'clock cheers. I don't know that we had much like that in the early years of HIV when the community was saving itself, that is, or when communities were saving themselves and doing this first responder work in our own communities, whether that be the gay community, Haitian community in New York, for instance, at the same time. Um, and so attending to care and to first responders, that's a, a deep abiding uh, similarity. Um, but I think that the differences are important as well. So how these viruses are transmitted, it's just different. <laughs> and um, not so, you know, the HIV suffers from the communities in, has suffered, all of us in HIV has, have suffered because of the communities where it was clear to us that HIV started to move. We, we have that um, problem here, I suppose, in relationship to bias and stigma and uh, Asian bias. Um, but putting that aside, and that's a big putting aside, the, sec the, the, the fact that HIV was sexually, is sexually transmitted and transmitted primarily through IV drug use produces different responses and different projects of education, sensitivity, different communities at risk that really make us have to think about HIV differently than COVID-19, which, which travels in the world and moves from body to body through very different ways of being in the world and very different in human engagements. And to not think about that is to not know how to educate each other and ourselves about safety um, and well-being. So it really blurs that. Um, no, it doesn't even blur it. It um, destroys the specificity of the human acts that, that in which we choose to engage and our own processes and thoughts about vulnerability and risk, very different acts. Um, I think that this question of visibility is also very important to me as someone whose AIDS activism has often been and primarily been about producing visibility because COVID-19 is, is extremely visible, extraordinarily visible, especially compared to the first five years of HIV, where HIV activism, AIDS activism, so much of it was simply to make it clear to those people who were not affected that it existed in our communities, that people were sick, that people were dying, that communities were devastated. That visibility problem, we don't have. So we have other visibility problems. So which COVID story is amplified, which COVID stories are taking up so much airtime? Certainly some stories are not being told, but COVID as a whole is known and is also receiving incredible amounts of resources, time, uh, quick, in time quickly, and um, many players, which again with HIV, a lot of our activism in the first one, five, 10 years was simply to get people to the table, to get money, to look for cure to um, build resources into communities um, that we are seeing unevenly distributed, certainly, but the, t I mean, this is a matter of months. So that uneven distribution seems important to me, but I think we do need to think about what does it mean for this to be happening so quickly, so visibly. Um, and perhaps my fear is that in that rush to visibility and activity and action, whole communities are going to be lost, whole communities that as HIV and AIDS activists, we understand who those communities are the most vulnerable. Our show is about the most vulnerable communities, not receiving attention, not receiving care. That is women in prison, black women in prison, people in prison in the early years of HIV. So, um, I think that the final thing I'd like to put on the table to this really amazing group of people is the question of stigma and disclosure. So 
Both of those have been extremely important over the decades of HIV and AIDS activism. How stigma continues, why stigma continues, who is stigmatized. I'd like to think about that in relationship to COVID-19 and to even ask if stigma is functioning quite as we knew it from HIV AIDS. And disclosure, well, many of you have been on calls with me where I have disclosed that I've had COVID-19 and um, I don't even want to think about his disclosure. <laughs> it's like, hey guys, I was sick for three weeks. Not that hard to say. It's important that you know it. It was super hard. And I want to think about is disclosure or acknowledging one's illness or vulnerability different in relation to uh, COVID-19 than it was and is for HIV AIDS. So that's um, my prepared remarks. I'm really interested to hear thoughts from the rest of you, but Tony, perhaps you want to come next? I mean, the, one of the things that I, I, I'm thinking about is um, when, I think it was Ted who initially reached out um, uh, with the prompt and asking to um, think about the comparisons. And, you know, this was sort of mid-March and my first reaction, and even with other, with fellow activists and colleagues and nonprofits, my f in first reaction was, whoa, 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 this is just started. Um, like, how are we drawing comparisons already? And I was, pr I was personally struggling with this idea of comparisons um, uh, because I felt like, well, there's a lot to, that needs to play out. And, um, but, you know, at that point, I was just like, I think I just need to listen, <laughs> you know, and, and, um, and, you know, hear what folks are saying and, and you know, very quickly, um, and even from the beginning, um, you know, there were comparisons to, 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 um, that were, you know, important. And um, so one of the things that just to some, some of what you, um, commenting on some of what you said, yeah, I have been both, um, you know, surprised and at the same time, of course, not at how in COVID, everyone's at risk in, in a way that was different in HIV AIDS. Um, uh, and yet the worst effects of um, the current pandemic, just like with HIV AIDS, are impacting um, the, the most marginalized groups, folks of color, um, people who, who um, the, the prim primary people losing their jobs are brown and black people. Um, the um, folks who are most at risk in returning to jobs such as you know factory jobs and and other places like just sort of around the meat pack, packing um companies are black and brown people the in in so many cities the the highest number of deaths black and brown people it is just so depressing that these the, the structural issues that we have in this country have not improved so that the worst impacts have not changed um, and that they continue to affect the most marginalized among us. Um, so that is, you know, for me, clearly a comparison between the two pandemics. Um, the other thing, and I think I, I sort of um, focused my piece on, you know, just sort of stigma and this sort of resistance to alarmism and resistance to, um, to, um, uh, uh, just um, um, st stigmatizing is because um, I noticed just so uh, early on that um, very sort of the, the, the sidewalks that say don't walk too close and um, you know things that were sort of beyond um, beyond what I felt was responsible um, and blaming each other, folks starting to blame each other, obviously, which has been clear um, and online. So I'm just really sensitive to the way this, if this continues on for as long as folks um, believe it's going to, I think that we're gonna see more of the stigmatizing each other, more of the, um, we're gonna see more folks being criminalized, just like, in you know the news today that uh, 35 out of the 40 people who were arrested for social distancing in Brooklyn were black, um, like that kind of thing is the kind of thing that I'm always sort of hyper aware of when 
um, when we're in a time of fear. And that's the thing that I felt was um, up during the AIDS HIV epidemic, there was so much fear and terror that oftentimes our response, um, our response around policing, our response about, around shaming and controlling bodies, the excuse was that it was worth it because of the consequences of that disease. And I just think that we always need to be careful about that. Um, and of course, um, uh, being careful and responsible and not um, you know, infecting each other and, and is, is this important and necessary. Um, but we have to make sure that we're not letting fear uh, make us cross lines in ways that is, are only going to get worse as this continues. Yeah, I think that's so important. I think we all have to be careful, especially white people have to be careful about how our fear is weaponized against black people and people of color and people who are already marginalized. So um, something that I really appreciated about your contribution, Tony, was you were really um, drawing forward what does not need to be um, brought back from previous, um, uh, previous pandemics. And that's something that I think is missing. We're, not, we're spending a lot of time trying to like put the hero crown on um, lots of AIDS activists from the past, which is fine. That's a different panel maybe. Um, but I'm really interested in what you and Alex have to say about like, what are some of the nuances that we can also drag forward? What are the, some of the things that aren't about heroism? What are some of the things that we wanna watch out for? And once you answer that, then we'll go to the questions. So where Kang will be first, and then um, we'll see what happens after that. Alex, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> Well, I feel it's a kind of loaded question um, or an easy answer the way you said it, Ted. Um, telling hero stories elevates large actions of people who are already powerful and visible or are struggling very hard for a certain kind of power and visibility. And every movement needs some of that and it's useful. So, you know, Thank you, heroes. Um, and it's a certain kind of person with a certain kind of power and privilege, and we need, we need that. But the daily acts of interpersonal and interpersonal empowerment, <laughs> which will, will never be lionized or heroicized or seen on that level are what make our lives matter to ourselves and our communities and the world. And again, I feel like that's what our show is about. Like, just because it wasn't visible didn't mean it didn't happen. It happened, it was hard for it to be visible. And part of what we did in relationship to archival activism is to make sure, you know, it would be an interesting question. Did we hear, heroize? heroinize those two women? I don't know, I hope not. Um, because no one deserves a single crown. You know, that work happened inside of community and a lot of what our show tries to, although it honors specific women, they were working inside of activist organizations. They were working in collectives. Collectives were speaking to each other. And these were very small and ongoing acts that human, all of us have the capacity to do, even at our weakest. And so, I don't know, that's my answer about heroes. Um, you know, my heroes are all of you. And it's because I know the specificity and human drama of your how what when each when each of you comes to the table again doing the acts that you do one, one way you want uh, uh, one way I'll, I, I'll answer that question Ted is um, that um, so I think like uh, the the best of the response around um, HIV and public health was uh, was you know harm reduction when 
um, which wasn't immediately uh, adopted by public health. And um, that there were people on the ground, there were activists and just regular people who were um, doing needle exchanges before those were, um, you know, um, uh, approved by um, uh, uh, the government and, and health departments. Um, and there were folks who were figuring out ways um, to reduce risk, risk around sexuality um, long before and, and sort of practicing, you know, there would be anecdotal um, sort of evidence that, you know, are, um, and there would be conversations among um, friends and folks about, you know, um, around different ways, strategies that they would use. And that all happened long before sort of the, the sort of the mantra around use a condom every time went away. And I think that today when I'm thinking about sort of COVID-19, like yesterday, I think I was reading this, or maybe it was this morning, um, an essay that was saying that um, there were some families, uh, I think in New York, who were choosing to um, be able to hang out with each other um, they were not related, um, and so that they could expand their circle, right? And that they were uh, afraid to tell other people about this because it may, may be seem as um, irresponsible. Um, and um, so I think that there's going to be sort of a, in, depending on if, if we don't have a vaccine, this is going to go on for a long time, there's going to be ways that folks on the ground are going to be practicing um, uh, harm reduction around um, COVID-19 that I think we just need to be sort of patient and respectful and um, and trust that folks are, are being responsible. And so that's the kind of thing, the kind of nuance that, um, that I think is going to be important in the coming weeks and months and however long this, um, uh, this lasts. Thank you. Um, Nick, are we able to unmute Kang to hear Kang's question? And Kang, when you're ready, just tell us your name and let us know where you're calling from. Oh, Kang is not on the call. Okay, so I'm gonna dig into some of the amazing um, comments that have come up on the side. Um, both Kat and Leslie have been, um, are are asking these really good, important questions about the things that we're talking about right now is like, and I think specifically Kat asks, what will be the collective response to criminalization? So Tony, you just mentioned about how people are finding out ways to build community and there's fear in that. And so to take it to a next level is how are we going to respond to criminalization together? And as Carol points out, we, we can't fall back on the strategies that we had in the past. Like we can learn a lot from ACT UP, but you know, we die-ins right now are harder than they ever were. You know, it's, you know, um, yeah. So I wonder if either of you have thoughts about what can a collective community response to the growing criminalization look like? I'll say one thing. I, I think that, um, you know, I remember like the the that weekend when folks in Florida like all packed the beaches, right? That was like weeks ago, a month ago, before there were lockdowns, and there was a lot of um, of um, you know there was that whole like Florida morons hashtag thing, and um, and so then you know like it, it happens in California too, right? I just think that people need to stop and think before. Um, before reacting to the ways that um, folks are dealing with um, this quarantine um, and how difficult it is. Now, I, obviously, this isn't excuse, uh, you know, all of this kind of behavior like these, um, you know, protests by people carrying Confederate flags and carrying, uh, you know, automatic weapons. And, um, who are saying, you know, completely stop the quarantines and get everything back in order. Obviously, that's foolish and irresponsible, but there's going to be a lot in between that we should be paying attention to and thinking twice before we, um, before we react, because as I even saw in some comments here, criminalization has already started, and I think we just need to be really vigilant uh, and point out that, you know, folks are human, human folks are scared. We've never had to stay in our houses for 
you know, more than two months. Um, this is a situation most of us in our lifetime have never been in. And there's got to be some a, sort of a give and take. Um, and we have to be careful about how, um, especially as sort of as communities on the left, how we're framing these kinds of discussions in the public um, and just sort of resist um, the shaming, the demonizing and, 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 and the criminalizing. seems really true to me. It's our, uh, our judgment is not helping sometimes. Alex, you want to jump in? Can people who are participating speak uh, with voices? Yeah, they can if they want to. Okay, because I don't know the answer to that question, Kat. If I did, I, you know, I would love to hear what some of the people on this call think. I would say that the thing that seems most apparent to me is that there's very little time has gone by. Eight weeks is an extremely long time to live alone in your apartment and is a very short time in relationship to movements, activism, mm -hmm. making sense of the specifics, imbalances and abuses of power that are distinct to the situation, even though they come out of late stage capitalism and, you know, techno utopianism and systematic ongoing racism, et cetera. So how do we manage these senses of time mm -hmm. um, at the same time? You know, AIDS, AIDS activism is, decades long and each year and each set of years we make gains over decades civil rights struggle depending on when you <laughs> clock it is hundreds of years long so you know how do we understand social change and justice as being on one timeline in our pain extreme pain and unique and different kind of indignities um, on us and more precarious bodies happening in this very short period of time. I do not know. Right. I, I think, really yeah, uh, we have not that much time left and I want to get to other things, especially there's this beautiful comment uh, from Ben that I think begins to kind of um, get to some of the things you were talking about time, but also other strategies. Ben asks, how can we as a culture take care of affection and intimacy? What other examples beyond HIV do we have to learn from in thinking about allowing and experiencing intimacy when, other, when any physical proximity is a risk? So one thing that I feel like we're all circling around is that part of the judgment, part of the frustration, part of the, the kind of tension that we're all in is like Tony was saying, we, we have never been through this before. And as Alex is saying, there's lots of pain. We're going through something really hard. And so of course it makes sense to lash out at joggers. And of course the police are gonna use that lashing out to then criminalize some people. Of course, some gay guys in New York are going to have a sex party and it's gonna get on the internet and we're all gonna have our hot takes, right? And so the question is, maybe as doulas, the question is, how do we figure out how to get to the heart of this? How do we make space for people to feel and mourn and name their sadness so that it doesn't get to the judgment and so that we can have some clarity around activism looks like? Um, and I think part of that is by looking at each other for answers. Uh, for example, J.D. Davids wrote a beautiful piece called How to Have Sex in an Epidemic, specifically looking at COVID. Um, we all know that releases some tension. Um, also thinking about um, um, uh, something that uh, our friend Jamie wrote, and I think I'm just going to read it because it's actually quite helpful. Jamie writes, within queer communities in the early AIDS epidemic, there was a lot of blaming and anger and shaming, but also mutual support and trust. So I think that's an important thing that they can coexist. I think about that playing out in the larger cultural sphere where there is much less shared accountability and trust. So maybe um, a question that we can wrap on is um, how do we forge trust in the age of distancing? And it doesn't have to relate to AIDS, it doesn't have to relate to COVID, just how do we create trust in the age of distancing? I think one, one um, answer is that we have to trust folks to figure out how they trust. Because um, mm. 
this is something that's going to be uh, personal. Um, you know, there may be sort of uh, sort of piggy and back, piggy backing on um, on Ben's comment. There may be folks who are going to have some um, identify sort of some intimacy buddies that they're going to trust to be able to hook up with over the coming months. Um, and that's not a fail safe strategy, but it might be one that works for a lot of people um, and um, that we're going to have to trust folks to, um, to uh, you know, implement them in their lives on their own. Um, and I think we need to, or sort of, you know, experts need to just give the, the facts, the information they have of how folks keep safe. Um, and then a lot of people are going to be interpreting facts. I'm going to trust that people are smart enough to make their own decisions, um, knowing that there are going to be people who make some foolish decision. But I'm going to trust that most people are going to make um, uh, informed decisions on how it, this impacts their own lives. And I'm going to trust folks to do that on their own. Alex? You know, I think I'll make a similar comment from before that I made about time that I, I want to make. It may be not exactly about space, but it's similar. It's like there is the, the personal is political, which is a feminist mantra, which always matters to me, which changes, but I can return to, tells me that my most intimate needs and my most intimate self and my most intimate fear and pleasure is mine to know and value and heal and use. And it is always to do that with and for others in community in relationship to bettering the world. And so these two scales are, are not, they're, they're, they, they cohabit, they coexist. They are one scale, the scale of the one's intimate needs, sexual, intellectual, <laughs> moral, and the, the, the needs of the world and our community of mother earth herself is one system and so you know it is it is in a short period of time that we're trying to figure out how to know our most intimate needs because we've been forced to and and how they sit in not dialogue as one mm -hmm. with the needs of our cities the needs of our friends <laughs> the needs of our earth um and i think helping each other that's what I tried to say in the doula piece, helping each other to understand how our most private, not just need, power, mm -hmm. is, can connect with, and we can learn from and share that with each other to build uh, on a different scale. It's what we've always needed to do. It's, it's odd that we're more intimate, we're more private, we're more distant, we're more alone, we're more discreet than we felt. And, and I don't want to say grand we. Some people, you know, have perhaps lived closer to this. Um, so learning from that and learning how to be in that other space mm -hmm. of full richness of humans is something we are going to have to work really hard on the, far, the longer we're farther apart from each other.